What's going on everyone? My name is Jasmine. Today's episode of The Slam Project is going to bring us to Winnipeg, Manitoba. On December 1st, 2022, Winnipeg police identified an alleged serial killer named Jeremy Sabicki. He is thought to have four victims. They are Rebecca Contois, Morgan Harris, Mercedes Myron, and a Jane Doe given the name Buffalo Woman. And only Rebecca has been found and the other three are thought to be lost in a landfill. And I am also going to be talking about another woman from Winnipeg named Tanya Nipanak. A serial killer confessed to killing her in 2011, and she is also thought to be lost in a landfill. And all information in this video is current as of December 10th, 2022. And if you would like to see more videos on missing and murdered Indigenous people, click that subscribe button and the notification bell. Now let's get right into it. Winnipeg has a long violent history against Indigenous women. It is a minefield for MMIW cases. Many factors come into play such as racism, homelessness, addictions, poverty, domestic violence, and past traumas, including intergenerational trauma. Growing up in foster care or having children in foster care also plays a factor. We are essentially the perfect victims and killers use that to their advantage. They know that no one outside of the Native communities will really care when an Indigenous woman comes up missing or murdered. We are often forgot about in the media and most times there is lack of concern from law enforcement and the public. Indigenous families will often be the ones who print out the missing person flyers, run social media campaigns, and conduct ground searches for their missing and murdered. There would be no one else looking for their relatives if they did not take matters into their own hands. It's essentially a living nightmare and it leaves many families traumatized over the whole experience. Canada launched a national inquiry into missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls in 2016. MMIW advocates had fought for a long time to get their government to do this. There were previous studies and symposiums before this, but having this done at a national level would ensure a more in-depth understanding of the MMIW epidemic that has plagued Canada for so long. The process of fact collecting and interviewing victims' families was a long, heartbreaking process. In 2019, a final report was published and 231 calls for justice were recommended. These recommendations are an attempt to stop the violence towards Native women. The Canadian government stated that the violence against Indigenous women amounts to genocide. It also confirmed what was already known, that the violence towards Indigenous women originated from acts of colonization. But to date, at the end of 2022, there has been little to nothing done about these recommendations, and the continued slaughter of Indigenous women continues in Canada. And many people say that these murders have been normalized in the public eye and is causing a lack of empathy from non-Indigenous Canadian citizens. Winnipeg a city with a large indigenous population is no stranger to violence against its people. Its most notable case would probably be that of Tina Fontaine. But the city's next chapter in the MMIW epidemic would come in the form of a serial killer that seemed to have butchered his victims. And this would shake the city to its core. So much so that MMIW advocates stood together in solidarity across Canadian cities to urge the government to declare a state of emergency in an attempt to keep Indigenous women safe and to raise awareness of the ongoing genocide. In some of my other videos, I have spoken about some of the root causes of the MMIP epidemic. They range from residential schools, the education system, child welfare, racism, addictions, and human and drug trafficking. I will put some video links in the description box if you want to watch them later. On December 1st, 2022, Winnipeg police announced that a man in custody for murder was an alleged serial killer and is suspected of having three more victims.
The man's name is Jeremy Skibicki and he is 35 years old. His now deleted Facebook account was riddled with white supremacist material and violent comments. He also said he was a member of Holy Europe, which is a small faction of a broader far right movement. He was also known to be a very violent person to his ex-wife Erin. She had stated that she met him in February 2018 outside of Salome Mission while she was waiting for a bed. She had been struggling with meth addiction at the time. Jeremy had approached Aaron with some of his friends and befriended her. She went back to his apartment and they began a relationship and soon married. He was nice at first, but then she soon feared for her own life. Aaron got a restraining order against him and ended the marriage. After he was arrested for murder, she was left wondering why he did not kill her. What led Winnipeg police to arrest Jeremy Skibicki began on Monday, May 16, 2022, when the partial remains of a woman named Rebecca Contois were found in a dumpster. She was 24 years old and a member of Crane River First Nation. She grew up in Winnipeg and was a mother to a young daughter. The location of the garbage bin was at the Mar Joy Apartments located at 253 Edison Avenue. Police arrived on the scene after receiving a call from a person saying that there was something of concern in the dumpster. Since all of Rebecca's remains were not at the scene, police located where the last garbage run was dumped at and it led them to the Brady landfill. They closed an area of the landfill and prepared to search. It would take a couple of weeks to get all the necessary supplies to conduct a safe search. In the meantime, Jeremy was arrested two days after the discovery of Rebecca's remains. Police searched the area around the dumpster where Rebecca's remains were found and also Jeremy's apartment which was located at 259 McKay Avenue, which was a couple blocks away. Police have been very tight-lipped about any information pertaining to the case and they did not say how they determined Jeremy was a suspect but it could be possible he was caught on someone's surveillance camera when he dumped Rebecca's body. The caretaker at the apartment building where Jeremy stayed at on McKay Avenue said that Jeremy would often have female friends over and make them wait outside while he went to the store. Jeremy lived on the top floor and was also helping renovate another unit next to his. So when police searched his apartment, they also searched the vacant unit he was helping with. The night before Rebecca's remains were found, the caretaker said that Jeremy made a few trips to the dumpster out back. He was throwing away garbage bags full of clothing and the caretaker even saw a backpack. It is possible the clothing Jeremy was throwing away were his souvenirs, but something had to prompt him to throw away the items he was holding onto. It seemed as if he knew he might get caught soon and was disposing of evidence. According to the caretaker, there were times when Jeremy could have the whole apartment building to himself during the day because everyone was at work. The caretaker also said sometimes there was a bad smell in the hallway. He just assumed it was from drug use. Back at the landfill on June 2nd, Search crews began looking for Rebecca through mountains of garbage that spanned the area of three to four football fields. More of her remains were found on June 14th and she was positively identified on June 21st, 2022. Police stated at the time Rebecca was found that they believe there were more murder victims. Homicide, missing persons, identification, and forensic units spent about six months piecing together Jeremy's movements and running forensic on the evidence collected from the search of Jeremy's apartment building. They would identify three other probable victims of Jeremy Skibicki and made the announcement on December 1, 2022. Since Crown attorneys already reviewed the necessary evidence used to charge him with the three additional counts of murder, there will be no preliminary trial. The case will head straight to trial and the date was set at January 13, 2023. 
They said that DNA played a role in identifying the additional victims, but they would not elaborate on what was tested. Clothing found during the search could have been tested, or there could have been large blood stains that would indicate that the person had died. The three other victims were identified as Morgan Harris, Mercedes Myron, and an unidentified woman who was given the name Buffalo Woman by First Nations elders. The order in which police think they were killed is as follows. Number one, Buffalo Woman is believed to have been murdered on or around March 15, 2022. Police believe she was in her mid-twenties with an average build. She wore a reversible baby fat brand jacket. One side was solid black with the baby fat logo of a cat on the back. When worn this way, there was a fur hood lining visible. When reversed, the whole jacket consists of striped black and white fur. And it is very possible that this jacket could be at least 10 years old. Baby Fat was established in 1999 by Kimora Lee Simmons. She left the company in 2010 and the company just recently made a comeback in 2019. But the clothing line now looks more athletic than the jacket that belonged to Buffalo Woman. So this jacket could be a hand-me-down, bought from a thrift store, or received from a donation box. You are urged to call the Winnipeg police if you knew someone who wore this jacket, but also do so if you remember anyone having this type of jacket from years prior. Winnipeg has a diverse First Nations population, so Buffalo Woman could be from anywhere in Manitoba or Canada. She could have also been out of touch with her family. Unfortunately, no sketch of her likeliness can be made because her remains have never been found. I will explain this a little further down in the video. Number two, Morgan Harris was a 39 year old mother to five children and a grandma to one. She was a member of Long Plain First Nation. It is believed she was killed on or around May 1st. Her family describes her as silly and happy go lucky. They also said that nobody ever had a bad thing to say about her. For the last 15 years of her life, Morgan struggled with addiction and homelessness. Her family searched for months when she went missing and never gave up hope of finding her. Morgan usually hung out in downtown Winnipeg and was last seen near Main Street and Henry Avenue. A candlelight vigil was held at 259 McKay Street where Jeremy lived. Police told one of her daughters that there was evidence found there that linked Morgan and another victim. Mercedes Myron to Jeremy Skibicki. Number three, Mercedes Myron was a 26 year old mother to two children aged seven and eight. She also was a member of Long Plain First Nation. Police believe she was killed on or around May 4th. Her grandma said she liked to tell jokes and had a big smile. She was a nice girl who trusted people. Mercedes had lost custody of her two children and started living on the streets after that. Her grandma said that losing her kids broke Mercedes. Mercedes' last contact with her family was on March 15th. And this is the approximate day that police believe that Buffalo woman was killed. How they determine this is unknown and strange because nobody knows who she is. Mercedes' family began looking for her that same month in March, and it was found out that she was last seen in the north end of Winnipeg. Mercedes' mother was scared to report her missing to the police because she did not want to learn that something bad had happened to her. Her family hoped and prayed that she would show back up and everything would be fine. But she was eventually reported missing on September 27, 2022. Posters were put up everywhere and every possible place was searched. Mercedes' family is now caring for her children. And Rebecca Contois was the fourth known victim. She was the first and only one to be found. Police have stated that Rebecca and Jeremy knew each other but would not elaborate. It is also unknown how the other victims were connected to Jeremy or if they even knew him prior. 
And police think that Jeremy acted alone. But remember his ex-wife said that when she first met him, she was approached by him and his friends. Police also will not speculate on a motive or if they think he targeted indigenous women. But many people think that he did target them and that he should also be charged with hate crimes. But it also appeared that Jeremy was targeting homeless women. It would be easy for him to entice them with drugs or alcohol and get them back to his home, perhaps offering them a place to stay. It was then revealed that the remains of Morgan Harris, Mercedes Myron, and Buffalo Woman have not been located, but there is enough evidence to charge Jeremy with their murders. Police stated that they believe their remains are in a landfill, and they let people assume that it was the Brady landfill where Rebecca was found. It was later discovered that police believe the remains of Morgan and Mercedes are actually at the Prairie Green Landfill and not the Brady Landfill. It has not been stated where they believe Buffalo Woman is. And Winnipeg Police Chief Danny Smythe stated that they would not search the landfill because they said it was not feasible because too much time has passed. Rebecca's partial remains were found in the dumpster soon after death. So police were able to pinpoint an area where her remains were located at the Brady landfill and isolate the area. The garbage truck used to transport her was equipped with GPS and a camera. In the few hours from the discovery of her body and when the Brady landfill was isolated, about 100 truckloads of garbage were dumped. They did not have this advantage with the other victims who were disposed of at Prairie Green. Chief Smythe used this as his reasoning for not conducting a search for the additional women. By the time that police were aware of Jeremy Skibicki on May 16th to June 20th, when they realized that there were more victims, 34 days had passed and 10,000 truckloads of garbage had been dumped at Prairie Green Landfill. In that same time frame, there also were 1,500 tons of animal remains and 250 tons of asbestos dumped with the garbage. The garbage on the site was then compacted and buried 40 feet deep under 9,000 tons of construction clay by the time the investigation led police there. Chief Smythe stated in a press conference on December 6th after a question from a reporter that there was no consultation with the federal government before deciding that it was not feasible to search the landfill for additional victims. With such a tall order of searching a compacted landfill, an attempt should have at least been made to ask for outside resources. The action of searching the landfill is beyond the means of what the Winnipeg Police Service can provide. Many in the indigenous community are outraged and horrified at the decision of not searching the landfill. And it is sending a signal to the public that it is okay to murder indigenous women and throw them away like trash. There have been several calls for the resignation of Winnipeg Police Chief Smythe. Chief Smythe responded on December 9th and said that he had fulfilled his duties as police chief by painstakingly gathering the necessary evidence needed to warrant the arrest of Jeremy Skibicki. He went on to say that this is one of the most important cases of his career and he intends to see the case through. He is hopeful that a conviction will be secured and that justice will be served for the victims of these heinous crimes. He also is now working with the Winnipeg Police Board and the mayor to seek possible solutions to recover the remains. Mark Chambers, who is the chair for the Winnipeg Police Board, said that the search would be a humanitarian effort rather than gathering any evidence. But I should add here that having the remains would be good for the case. No body homicide convictions are a little more complicated than normal cases, and some jurisdictions will not even attempt prosecution without remains. It eliminates any doubts that the person is still alive and well. Morgan Harris's daughters, Cambria and Kara, have become her voice and they are doing a great job advocating for their mother. 
They traveled to Ottawa to address the federal government about the decision not to search the landfill. They spoke about the need to find the bodies to give them a proper burial and to say that all human life matters. They also said they would search themselves if they had to. With so much support for these victims that have not been found, I do see it possible that there would be hundreds or even thousands of volunteer searchers. On December 8th, 2022, it was announced that operations at the Prairie Green Landfill had been paused. Indigenous community leaders had requested the pause in operations, and they have also asked for an assessment and feasibility study for locating the other remains. A forensic expert in California had stated that it is possible to locate the remains, but he stated it would be difficult, expensive, and time-consuming. The forensic expert also said that to pinpoint a search area or layer, you could look at the contents of the garbage for newspapers. These have dates on them so it would be a good indicator of what area to search. The indigenous community is ready to step up and help aid in the search. Bernadette Smith, one of the founders of Drag the Red, responded to a question in the Facebook group and said that they would put out a call for volunteers when and if they ever get the clearance to search the landfill. Chief Smythe had said that funding was never an issue. Proper investigations take time and money. So I guess Winnipeg police do not think finding the remains of these women were worth the time or effort. The victims' families and the federal government should have been consulted before the decision to not search the landfill was made. If a search is ever granted at the Prairie Green Landfill, it is possible that other remains could be found. There are numerous missing Indigenous people in Winnipeg. There was another serial killer identified in Winnipeg in 2012. His name was Sean Lamb and he targeted Indigenous women. He was convicted of manslaughter for killing Lorna Blacksmith and Carolyn Sinclair. He received two 20-year sentences. His third victim was Tanya Nipanak. She was a 31-year-old mother who lived in the West End of Winnipeg. On September 13, 2011, she left her home at about 11 p.m. to go to a nearby restaurant to have a drink. She only had $5 with her, so she should have come right back. After Sean Lamb was arrested for the two other murders in 2012, he confessed to killing Tanya. It is believed that Sean killed Tanya the same night she went missing and disposed of her in a garbage bin. A search of the Brady landfill was started on October 3, 2012, but was stopped on October 9 without ever finding her body. At the time, Constable Jason Michelson stated that the search was grueling and that officers had to wear respirators because of the risk of being exposed to toxic gas during the excavation. He then stated that the officer's safety was paramount. But the fact they only searched for about a week shows their lack of commitment. Sean Lamb would eventually have the charges against him for Tanya's murder stayed because it was discovered that he was paid $1,500 by Winnipeg police for his confession to murder in Tanya. Her body also was not found, so that complicated the situation more but he most likely did kill her because he pled guilty to two manslaughter charges and also led the police to Lorna's body, so it's not like he was completely innocent. To add insult to injury, Tanya's aunt Sue Caribou said that Winnipeg police told her that if the family wanted to, that they could erect a memorial for Tanya at the Brady landfill. This is an extremely insensitive thing to suggest. This angered Tanya's family immensely. All they wanted was to find her remains and bring her home. These women and any other people in the dump deserve to be found. Their families would like to give them a proper burial and have a place to mourn, visit, and honor their memories. The fact that this could happen and not have a huge public outcry amongst non-Indigenous people is disgraceful. Mass unmarked graves at landfills and residential schools 
should not be considered acceptable, no matter the person's age, race, or social standing, all people deserve to be found. And does Jeremy Skabicki have any other victims out there? The police do not think so. But these murders seem like the work of a seasoned killer. The fact that he had four murder victims in the span of a couple months is frightening. If he does have any more victims, how long has he been killing? In Facebook posts from people who knew Jeremy, he was known to hang out with indigenous people. Is he connected to any more missing people? Jeremy is currently being held at the Milner Ridge Correctional Center. His attorney says that he plans to plead not guilty. And I do hope that the Winnipeg police and the Crown prosecutor has their case together because we do not need another acquittal as in the case of Tina Fontaine. Thank you so much for watching today's video. I'm going to probably be keeping track of Jeremy Sabicki's trial and probably do an updated video. And if you knew any of these victims, please share any memories of them. And I will see you in my next video.